Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we traveled to Vienna and Budapest to speak with two free market movement leaders struggling with the growing control their respective governments are taking over larger and larger sectors of the economy. First up is Dr. Barbara Kolm, director of the Austrian Economic Center and president of the F.A. Hayek Institute. Barbara, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Welcome to Vienna. It's wonderful to be here in Vienna, my first visit. Perhaps for our, our listeners, it'd be helpful if you could start by describing a little bit about the work of Epe Hayek and the economics that you follow here at the center. Well, as you already pointed out, I mean, this is the roots of the Austrians. Most of them were born here. Mm -hmm. Most of them worked here. They were educated here. Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School, mm -hmm. this famous economist who wrote the Principles of Economics in 1870s. He, that far back? Yes, that far back. He was the teacher of Crown Prince Rudolf. <laughs> so you see, we're really on very <laughs> historic been at ground. Been for a while. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and he was actually the founder. And then people like Mises, Hayek, uh, Schumpeter, Wieser, Böhm Bawerk, who has been a federal minister of mm -hmm. finance twice, actually. They were all working out of Vienna until, unfortunately, in the late 30s, we yep. had this big ba brain drain, and many of them left for the United States, mm -hmm. which was good for you, but bad yeah. for us. Yeah. Take us back to those times where Keynesian philosophy began to rule. Many of the governments in, in Europe adopted socialist economic policies, and Hayek sort of disappeared for a while. Take us to his roots and the philosophy that led him to the Nobel Prize. Well, may I even take you back one more sure. after World War I? Mm. Because this was actually the, the real starting point with Hayek and Mises mm. when, they, when they worked on the business cycle theory. When Mises was criticizing uh, the uprise already of socialism and mm -hmm. totalitarianisms, because after World War I, Europe or Germany, Austria being destroyed, mm -hmm. being uh, reduced to their uh, very small little roots, the uprise in the population, people were poor, people suffered, there mm -hmm. was nothing to eat, uh, they had huge inflation problems, the monetary issues oh, were yeah, there. Sure, the Weimar so, Republic and exactly. the hyperinflation. So this was the big deal. And this, of course, influenced Mises and mm -hmm. Hayek with their work. And they uh, wanted to find out what is the, the, the reason for these problems. And this is uh, what, what they did with their, with their research mm -hmm. on the business cycle theory and on monetary policy. Plus, and I think this is most important to realize that the methodological individualism that Hayek was talking about always, that the individual is the one who makes the decisions. Mm -hmm. It's not the government, it's not society. The individual actor, the entrepreneur. Exactly. It, it's exactly this person who takes the risks, who makes his own decisions, and he knows best what is good for him. And we have lost this after the wars, mm -hmm. also, af af of course, after the Second World mm -hmm. War too, because people all of a sudden started relying on governments. Mm -hmm. For everything. Exactly. The governments became bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, from the cradle to the grave, the government makes sure that you're taken care of. People do not realize. In the U.S. now, we call it the life of Julia. It was a campaign theme uh, that Obama ran about how a woman who was taken care of from cradle to grave, basically the state was her father, the state was her husband, all the way through. Exactly. And, and we, have, we in Europe have started that, unfortunately, a couple of decades earlier mm -hmm. than you in the United States. I mean, look at our welfare states who do not work. Mm -hmm. We cannot finance them anymore. People do not understand that it's actually their own money that the taxman takes before before he is redistributed. Before they redistribute exactly, it. Exactly, before they redistribute it. And this is the point. So Hayek and Mises were exactly on this point, where they tried to make people understand that socialism doesn't work, that the achievement principle is a precondition for well-being, for economic growth. Mm -hmm. And for progress. So Hayek can be difficult to approach for many readers, and I know I struggled with some of his books, but I discovered, of course, his book, The Fatal Conceit, which I think was his last book, very approachable. All of a sudden, the lights came on, and it all made sense. And it's a very short book. Let me ask perhaps a cheeky question. Did he really write it, or did one of his students write it? <laughs> no, Hayek wrote it He himself, really did, because yes. it's so readable. Um, well, one has to understand... If you look at the at the road to serfdom, I mm -hmm. mean, actually his most famous book, but probably not not his best. Yeah. Or, but Hayek 
being an Austrian who had been to the United States in the 1920s for the first time. Mm -hmm. A little bit shaky English because, you know, mm -hmm. back then students were educated in French, sure. in, in Italian, in, in, in European right. language, other European languages, but not in English to this extent. So his English was not perfect. And if you look back, the road to serfdom, a couple of hundred pages long work, was condensed by Reader's Digest uh, <laughs> journalists, 16 different journalists, really? into one 50-page uh, booklet, pamphlet, yeah. pamphlet. And this complicated language was really condensed and easy to read. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. It can be approached. It can be approached. And, and this made him world famous all of a sudden in 44. Mm -hmm. And uh, his later works, especially uh, Law, Legislation and Liberty, mm -hmm or his, his works on, on, on money theory mm -hmm. and everything else, they're very complicated. The older he became, the more of a social philosopher he got. Mm -hmm. Till the end, where it became something everyone could understand, particularly uh, what you call the information problem. Maybe you can talk just briefly about that, then we can move to contemporary issues. Well, this goes exactly to the point why Hayek uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, because he explained how knowledge is being created in society. And it's, the, it, again, the individual who learn, who knows mm -hmm. best and from the individual on the chain of information is created to a bigger... Through exchange. Uh, through exchange to a bigger picture. And this, this is the thing where Hayek says, you, the individual, you know best. You don't want the government to intervene or institutions. Mm -hmm. No central planning, no socialism, no totalitarianism. It's the individual who is the actor. This is so important to have these people in the center, uh, that the individual mm -hmm. is in the center. And this is, clear, this is clearly not what's happened in Europe. Europe now finds itself in the midst of a monetary crisis, in a fiscal crisis, and in a growth crisis all at once. As you sit here in Vienna and look out, what, what do you see ahead? Well, in Austria, we're still kind of well off. Mm -hmm. People don't feel the crisis yet. Because uh, again, after, yeah, after 80 years of uh, one way or other of socialism that we have seen, here in Europe, people are used to big governments mm -hmm. and to big state, as we talked at the beginning, who mm -hmm. take care of. They have entirely forgotten that uh, it's much better to have your own mm -hmm. choices. So... There are three things. One step is we have lived way too long beyond our means. Mm. We have spent way too much money on social security, on welfare, entitlements. On, on entitlements. Which are a German invention, I mean, after all. Yeah, Bismarck was the one who actually started with that. I mean, unfortunately, he implemented it in a way that uh, you know people got used to it mm -hmm. and we cannot get rid of it. When back then people did not live as long mm -hmm. and uh, they worked much longer than mm -hmm. they did a lot, nowadays. A longer percentage of their lives, that's exactly. for sure. Exactly. I mean, if we look, uh, we have working hours of 38 mm -hmm. uh, hours per week, which is ridiculous. Uh, if you have to work for 40 hours, people start protesting. We have countries with minimum wages. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these things uh, literally reduce the competitiveness of a country and the productivity. And once you lose productivity, you're doomed. But if you have a rapidly expanding population, like any Ponzi scheme, you can get away with it. But the population has stopped growing. Exactly. And, you know, uh, if we look at post-war, World War II Europe, the German economic miracle. Back then, mm -hmm. a lot of economic growth, of course, reconstruction, mm -hmm. but also with the help of, of U.S. money, we have to admit the that. The plan, sure. Exactly. Without that, it probably would. But German it, industry became very competitive. <laughs> yes. Very productive. Because back then, they were eager to mm -hmm. be self to be responsible self responsible and mm -hmm. independent and this is something that we have forgotten now with the big picture of the european union which started out as a peace project mm -hmm. and all of a sudden uh, with this uh, one size fits all politics, the currency problems that we have created. 20,000 pages of regulations on cheese making. Uh, well, this is overall, I yeah. mean, this is on top of that. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of issues that one should, should mm -hmm. start with. So first, of course, the economic miracle doesn't work anymore. Right. We have built the welfare states that worked until the 70s. And from then on, we built tremendous sovereign debt. And we were borrowing and mm -hmm. borrowing and borrowing. But, you know, politicians who want to be reelected, and then we come in with, we have the combination of, of Hayek's creation of knowledge in society mm -hmm. and public choice theory, politicians who want to be reelected. Sure, just, promise goods uh, yeah, for in the future. Exactly. And it works. 
it works. Unfortunately, the voter still doesn't understand that it's, that it's his own money that is being used inefficiently. Greece is a very difficult case, and Greece has always been different from many other mm -hmm. European countries. And one has to stress that the Greek economy is too small, actually, to, um, to destroy the European mm. one. But the mentality that we have seen there with all the entitlements, with all the fraud. Labor regulations, with all, everybody working as a civil servant, you know, getting paid yes. 13 months for 12 months of work, retiring at age 50. Or, or not even existing anymore. I mean, we had cases where people had already long been dead, but their pensions had right, been paid to paid. other, yeah, yeah to, to their families. I mean, this, this is really theft. And then, of course, we had the issue that many people did not pay taxes at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. And the inefficiency of the, of the governing structures has been something. And I would say in some countries it has been a sport to to cheat on government sure, sure. because you're a fool if you pay your taxes exactly in those countries. i mean you have to understand the history of 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 greece and turkey for sure. example they have always been occupied and they tried not to pay taxes mm -hmm. to the ottomans so this it's is history culture. it's in the culture but on the other hand you know if you reduce taxes or limit them and then, you know, people are willing Less to painful do... Less yeah, to pay. 10% exactly. here's your money, no problem. Yeah, it has worked. 50% I mean, I'm going to hide it in the mattress. In the monarchy, you had 7% of income tax yeah. at a max in Austria. Look across the periphery. So we have Greece, we have Spain, we have Portugal. Youth unemployment is, what is it now in Spain? In Spain, 40%. 40%. Yeah. So there's an entire generation now Lost. that's gone missing in action, not yeah. contributing economically, and yet they're supposed to be supporting their retired elders through, yeah. through entitlements. And the German machine is keeping the whole thing going. How long can that last? It will only last until the German uh, individual finally understands that the redistribution on a supranational level, which we now see, does not work anymore. And sooner or later, their competitiveness uh, will definitely uh, suffer. And it it's already at the point, if we look at the growth rates, mm -hmm. Germany is not growing to as it was in the past years mm -hmm. anymore because of all those entitlements and because of all this supranational... Um, but when will the Germans start to feel it? I was at the BMW plant mm -hmm. in uh, Rengersburg. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Incredibly productive facility. Happy, busy workers. What do they care? Well, they will care if, if BMW will not be able to export anymore. Because their cars are way too expensive to uh, than uh, than others who are produced in Asia or anywhere else in the world and much cheaper, and you know there is global competition and uh, even if you have a great brand and a great product, other people will catch up. I mean this is this is uh, this is economics. This is this is the real world, and uh, eventually you cannot hide this. And this is what politicians have done way too long from the European mm -hmm, citizen. Mm -hmm. You cannot protect the citizen by telling him, hey, I'm sh I'm, I make sure that you will be paid your pension and another promise on healthcare and another promise on kindergartens and mm -hmm. another promise on education. This does not work. The money cannot be printed endless, uh, endlessly. I mean, we have kicked the can down the road way too long. And uh, Europe is now following actually the American uh, Fed model. Mm -hmm. And this definitely does not do Runs any good, no. So Barbara, you've written a great deal about corporatism, which I guess in the US we might call crony capitalism. Its impact on the European economy, and of course we see it in the United States as well. Maybe you can explain a little bit about the difference between crony capitalism and free market capitalism. Well, free market capitalism is nothing else but the protection of property rights. This is, I think, the simplest explanation. It's people being allowed to take care of their own property, to risk their own money, to make their investments, to make their own choices. And to fail. And exactly, failure is something most important. Mm. And to embrace failure it's cleansing. is cleansing, it, but something that we in Europe have not incorporated. People look at a at an entrepreneur who goes bust mm -hmm. in a very different way than uh, you in the United States. Sure. And, you know, going bust is something, talking about this, that we don't like in Europe at all. Yeah, I mean, we, to allow we, it. We, we bail out banks, we bail out yeah. countries, and the results are, uh, you know, terrible, as you, as you see. So, free market capitalism 
is something totally different than crony capitalism. As you say, cronies, those cronyisms that we have seen, especially in Eastern Europe when uh, when it was opened mm -hmm. after after the fall of the Berlin Wall 25 years ago. I mean, this November uh, will be a, a mem very... Right, it's 25 years. It's a memorial uh, year this year. But we've seen the growth of social structures organized around interest groups, whether these be labor interest groups or industrial interest groups, and rather than having in the individual worker or the individual firm express himself in the market, these guilds operate in conjunction with the government to plan the economy. It worked for a while. It seems to be stalling. But here in Austria, which is a beautiful country, what levels of entrepreneurship do you see here? What do business startups look like in Austria? Business startups here in, in Austria are very weak. Very, the environment for startups is, is poor, mm. both on the financial side and on the institutional side. They have to go through tremendous uh, regulation mm. and approvals. Uh, approvals. It takes a while until you can open a business, way too long actually. Mm -hmm. The next step is you know the finance, getting the money for the young uh, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. is very difficult as you know. Money is not as easy to get for for entrepreneurs. They rather invest in something, or banks rather invest protective in businesses. something protective. Yes, or buy government bonds, mm -hmm. which is now the only way they can make uh, money. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, right. interest rates are low, so this on close to zero. Right. So this is this is a big issue. But coming back to institutions and institutionalism as we see it in 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 Europe. If I would be a radical, I would say we harmonize ourselves until we are dead. Hmm. Because um, there is no such thing as, you know, confronting um, the, system. But the unions on the one hand hmm. and the political parties. We don't have a Thatcher or a Reagan who stood up against the unions and say, hey, there are limits. Um, we cannot create economic growth and we cannot secure your jobs if you are not willing to negotiate with us to a certain extent. I mean, people literally do not understand that they kill those who create their jobs. So mm. they eventually they, they reduce their own, their own opportunity. This corporatism, as we see it in, in Europe with um, both the chambers of commerce or um, the old guild system that has been there for a very long time, has a next very bad consequence which is all the regulations that are rooted in, mm -hmm. in, in, in these systems. Mm -hmm. And then you have interferences uh, in, in, in the business yeah, world, in the corporate world. people accept it. People seem to accept it. Let me ask a question that might be difficult for an Austrian to answer. We were in Meltz uh, mm -hmm. yesterday, most beautiful Baroque cathedral I've ever seen, incredibly orderly town. In fact, everywhere you look in Austria and, and in Germany, you see order. Everyone's following the rules. The don't walk sign comes on. There's no cars coming. People won't walk across the street. They, they obey the traffic lights. How could such a civilized, orderly place produce a Hitler? That's a tough question to ask. I think we have to look back in history. And if we see the results of the Weimar Republic or what has happened in the Weimar Republic, uh, Versailles, the treaties of mm. Versailles, I think these are the roots uh, for uh, for creating uh, something like mm. this terrible totalitarianism that we have seen. Second thing is the media back then did not work the way we know it now. Mm. If somebody st stood up and, and, and spoke like that, uh, the media all of a sudden would be on, uh, on them and would at least put question many question marks and the message would not be delivered that easily plus of course i mean look at the unemployment rate we had we had already discussed the monetary issues the inflation mm -hmm. there was no work literally there the german society the, the, the was suffering they had not only lost a lot of and he uh, was promising answers exactly same thing as politicians do nowadays yeah. they just give promises and empty shells And people, you know, it's follow those, But unfortunately. But let's, let's look at Greece. Suppose we run the clock ahead. Suppose yeah. that the European Union does run out of money. Suppose we do begin to see unemployment in Germany and, and inflation and hard times. 
we're seeing neo-Nazis rise in Greece. Mm -hmm. We have you know, hard right-wing parties that are using even symbols and expressions mm -hmm. that are fascist. Could you see fascism return to Europe? I would see both sides on the on the social democratic sides and on the far left mm. and on the far right. There is extremisms, uh, extremism that, that that is rising on both sides, and those isms are are have the not danger. Gone away. Exactly, mm. they have not gone away. And if if there is threat, if the economy doesn't work, after all, it's the en the engine for growth and mm. well being. If these things do not work then we are in, th in danger of, mm. of something. Of repeating history. Exactly. And people don't learn, after all, from history, which they should. <laughs> so what is your role here at the Austrian Economic Center at the Hayek Institute in strengthening the center and, and defending against those extremisms? Well, we preach, literally, to be self-responsible, to care for European values, for the traditions that we have uh, embraced, actually, for hundreds of mm. years you know, being honest, being trustworthy, working hard, being entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And if you if we look at various places in Europe, oh, you there look are, back through the industrial revolution. Yeah, sure, the I mean, entrepreneurism there, thrive. Yeah, but you know, if you if we go, for example, to Tirana, we just had a conference two weeks ago uh, as a result of our free market roadshow in Tirana. This society is so entrepreneurial. Those guys open shops everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, and run their try. own businesses, mm -hmm. give it a try, take the risk. And they are lucky they don't have those regulations yet. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not joining the EU yet. Mm -hmm. And and so they, they can really move forward and they don't have anything to lose. So these roots that are in our European mindset, mm -hmm. uh, we should remember them. I mean, after all, we had Adam Smith and many other great mm -hmm. philosophers who uh, pointed this out and who, who wrote on that, who worked on that. And we have so many great entrepreneurs, uh, great companies, mm -hmm. great business people who go for it, who take the risk. And we should not limit them by governments like France or mm -hmm. Spain, who have the worst uh, labor regulations right. ever. Make it impossible to, to start and make employees liabilities for life. No one wants to hire. Exactly. And, and so if we don't get rid of those regulations, we will not be able. So this is what we tell people. Structural reforms mm -hmm. is the first thing that we need to do, despite the fact they, are, th they hurt. Mm -hmm. But Thatcher would not have... Uh, change Britain if she had not undergone through these uh, these reforms. Pain. It is. It is painful, but we have lived on other people's money way too long and uh, have partied way too long. <laughs> so you have to take some pain as well. Um, it's difficult to tell the truth, but we have to eventually. Plus, I think that being self-responsible, being somebody who believes and embraces individual freedom mm. is crucial we only understand freedom once we have lost it mm -hmm. and this is what people who have lived on the other side of the iron curtain yeah, have they learned know that. they, they know that. this it's 25 recent. years ago mm -hmm. um, when they all of a sudden became free they understood what it means and and they embraced this and this is our opportunity in europe that societies who have been under pressure for so for such a long time or have suffered communism that people have have got this in mind and they open up much easier mm -hmm. to our message we're uh, kind of boiled mm -hmm. in the west mm -hmm. and we take it for granted there is nothing that is for granted freedom is not is not for granted entrepreneurship is not mm -hmm. for granted um, we have to work very hard to bring to, to bring it back and this is, I think, the entrepreneurial spirit that we have to embrace. And we consider both the Austrian Center and the Hayek Institutes as intellectual entrepreneurs. We run those institutes as if, if they were businesses. On those models, yeah. And otherwise, I think we, we as think tanks, especially given this leftist environment that we live in, mm -hmm. uh, we would not have survived. Barbara, thank you so much for the invitation to meet with you. And I look forward to seeing more of Vienna. It's a pleasure to have been with you. That was Barbara Kalm, who we spoke with at the Austrian Economic Center in Vienna, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. To send us comments and feedback on this or any of our past shows, visit realclearradio.org and click on the email bill link. Real Clear Radio Hour is a partnership with Real Clear Politics, one of America's top political websites. 
our Check Wheel Clear every day for the latest news articles, election polls, and political commentary. Ahead, we travel to our next stop down the Danube, where we speak with Zoltan Kess, co-founder of the Free Market Foundation in Budapest. Stay tuned.